You can pray it, but until you say it, wow. it does. The, in silent faith moves no mountains. Wow. And that's a big deal is we don't want to risk our reputation. We just want God to expose his. And until we risk our reputation, God will not show his reputation. Oh. <laughs>
or maybe confessions at the altar, depending on who you're interviewing. Huh? So, <laughs> but uh, I'm just honored. I've been in ministry. I am 54, uh, 33 years full time for 33 years. Even before that was part time. Uh, I am just so honored. I love it. And the Blue Angels have a theme, uh, and that theme dominates everything they do. And it's glad to be here. And that's how I feel. Glad to be here in Tampa. Glad to be here on this podcast. Glad to be here tonight in this worship setting because it's going to be exceptional, sensational. This is the first. Tampa Life sets the vibe for all tonight's. We're trendsetters. (laughs) And so uh, we're going to have a great time tonight. We're looking forward to it. Starting in ministry, I did not grow up in a pastor's home. Uh, I grew up in a a son of a construction worker. And a very colorful, engaging character, highly intelligent. He was the smartest man I knew, and he reminded me of that on a consistent basis. <laughs> and so uh, he, I get it honest, honestly, and yeah. so he is just amazing. He was an amazing father, but he did not attend church. He was not in church, did not have a religious experience of any kind. And uh, I was privileged to see him receive the Holy Spirit 24 hours wow. before he died. And so at the age of, I think it was 75. And so just an amazing, amazing situation with my father. How old were you at that time? Mm, 38, I believe. 38, 39, somewhere around there. Maybe maybe older. I I don't know. Run those. I I don't know. I'd have to run the numbers, man. It all blurs together when you're over 50. You know, so uh, you just forget it all. Um, Unlike uh, some that remember clearly. I don't always get all those dates right. But I was an adult. And I think I, I actually, I think I was in my 40s. It was around 38. God reminded me of a promise that he, I would see his salvation. And I began to pray uh, and, and, and speak it. Because part of, you can pray it, but until you say it, wow. it does, the, in silent faith moves no mountains. Wow. And that's a big deal. Is we don't want to risk our reputation. We just want God to expose his. And until we risk our reputation, God will not show his reputation. Oh. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> can we? Those like twenty nuggets. Yeah, now. yeah. He he talking clips. <laughs> <laughs> he talking clips. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. He said, "Hold on, I need I need you to back that up. We might have forgot that. We, thank God it's recorded. If you heard what he just just rewinded a couple couple seconds and go back, you said, silent faith moves no mountains.'" Moves no mountains. And God is, will move mountains. Say that again. So silent faith moves no mountains. And so, I mean, you know, if we expand and go deeper into that, we're commanded to speak to the mountain and tell yes. it to go. And until we speak, there's no action. So we like to internalize faith because there's no risk involved. So we say we believe, but until we open our mouth and say it, nothing happens. Until you say it, it doesn't change it. And so you have to speak your faith to see transition and transformation happen. So I started speaking about my father. And, and, I, and I'm kind of convinced that we play it safe. Okay. And, you know, we, we put a caveat on every prayer we pray, if it be your will. Yeah. I'm not even sure why we say that, because if it's not his will, he's not going to do it. Wow. But we say it to guard Jesus. us looking foolish. Oh, yeah. We don't want to say, get a miracle. Guilty. I pray over you for a Guilty. miracle. I'm praying over this. And if it be God's will, that's really about my reputation. Wow. That's not about God's sovereignty. Wow. You, you, he's not going to go above or supersede his sovereignty. So he's not going to do it if it's not best for you. So you don't have to throw that permission-based prayer in. He's already, you, he already knows it. He already knows. Oh, wow. You just ask and you shall receive. So I made up a, a, my mind long ago that I wouldn't get to heaven and have this mandate against me. You had not because you asked not. Oh. Jesus says you have. So I decided, hey, oh, I'm going to ask it. I'm going to ask it and see what happens. And I'm going to roll and flow with it and let's go. And if I end up looking silly or foolish, then that's on me. But so often I have seen when I'm willing to risk my reputation, God exposes his. But he will not until you risk yourself. Faith involves risk and the risk is usually our reputation. So I started speaking about my father all over the country. One time there was a funny incident that happened. I was preaching in L.A. They were broadcasting it. I said, my reprobate father will receive the spirit before he dies. Wow. He was watching and I didn't know it. My wife was visiting my parents and they were watching me live. And he just was started rocking in the rocking chair and said nothing. But but what I unknown to me, he had been reading his Bible. And it led him to what some people don't believe in a deathbed conversion. I just think it proves the mercy of God that it never runs out. 
that it's new every morning. And so 24 hours before he passed, I was privileged to watch him pray through in the spirit. And he'd been baptized with me as a child, but had never walked in that. So, you know, my path to ministry was not typical. And uh, my path to ministry was one of, of difficulty and trying to really find myself. And so I ended up after I graduated in Jackson at the Bible school there, which I had gone to other places first, I ended up uh, traveling as an evangelist for six years, but I went to Wyoming and Montana and preached every night, seven nights a week for these little bitty home missions churches, little bitty churches of 10 and 12, and they give me the offering, they just give me cash. And so I get like $30 one night and $4 the next night, you know, so, but I would preach every night. I did that for years. And that, in that process, I just kind of found who I was. And then one day God began to open doors that were outside that area of, you know, it was the west, it was the Northwest. It was from Colorado all the way to British Columbia. And so it was kind of the path. And then here I am in Tampa. And, and I'd love to say this, that Tampa is the destination. The rest of my life was the details. And so my, the, the beginnings, the first church I pastored in California was not my destiny. It was just the details. Wow. Tampa is where I was created to be. Wow. And I think finding that is imperative for everyone. What is your calling? Who are you? What's your niche? And what are you made for? Right. You know, that the hope of that calling, the scripture says, that you would know what he hoped for yes. when he made you. Yes. So I want the optimal package. I want yes. to be exactly <laughs> when he thought of me and my yes. unique DNA Nothing and else. unique fingerprint. Yeah. I only want to do what he knew was optimal for that me. Is so, that is so incredible. We got to talk more about that. I want to talk more about that. Um, let's move over to EJ. I want him to be able to introduce himself and then we can jump right back into that conversation that Pastor was having about purpose and about discovering that purpose and finding that purpose and not stopping until you 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 figure what figure out the path that it need that you need to be on in order to get there. So EJ, if you if you don't mind, just kind of again very similar to what Pastor just kind of did, like introducing yourself, who you are, introducing yourself to the audience. Well, next time, let me go first. <laughs> I'm gonna just say that because we're at this climax and I'm about to bring this down. <laughs> You're not gonna bring uh, it down. EJ's awesome. I love my pastor. We no. gotta start with the man of God. We gotta, we gotta let the man of God <laughs> start. Look, man. Because that's what's keeping everybody listening right now, you know? Not true. Oh, Not true. They're here because of you two. No. I'm, just, right. I'm just the side servant. You know, the little appetizer on the side. That's know. a good appetizer. Yeah, I'm telling great. you right There's now. There's been enough. Is look, that fried I'm chicken? Full. There's been enough nuggets here that's already been dropped. So <laughs> I'll say this, man. Um, my journey, my, you know, my mom and dad got married in the church. So I was very fortunate to be raised in a home uh, with a mom and a dad that loved God and told us to love God. Yeah. Uh, and then at an early age, man, I realized that I had uh, musical talents. Um, to say the least, just so everybody, to say and, that he's saying the least. And uh, I just had opportunities to use my gifts, man. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to fail forward. Yeah, wow. And, I love um, that. you know, so, and honestly, it's, History. I grew up in a home where they made you read and they made you pray. We had to read two chapters a day and yeah. write about it. Ooh, wow. And then, yeah, really? Yes. And, and I was, yeah. no. <laughs> I'm so interested. Open That's book. I was in Nehemiah for like eight months and they started, <laughs> I got to start reading it to make sure y'all not reading the same chapters. Wow. We tried to get them, but they, they <laughs> learned. Um, but they you know, too saved. We went to church. It, it literally felt like every day. I was raised under the pew. I mean, it was just one of those things, man. And uh, I grew up with a terrible speech impediment. It was bad, like it was, it was extremely terrible. And honestly, for a good portion of my early life, I resented God because I, I like to talk. Yeah. But imagine going to a place to eat and you want something, but you can't say it, so you gotta order, say, I want what he wants. Wow. It was one of those things. And I remember I was in my room and I said, God, why'd you do that? And God told me that I'm going to use you, and I want you to know that it's not you. Wow. Beautiful. Praise God. And Praise God. We all need that lesson. That's so good. I can't it. forget that lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the rest is, he, you know, history. I met my wife um, at a camp. Okay. The Lord does wonders at camps. <laughs> <laughs> Just let you know. I slid into the DMs. 
Safe. <laughs> Safe. <laughs> Slid into the DMs. She responded. That's a uh, great conversation to have. The guys like DMs and slide men because oh, they don't want to. They want to expose themselves. Man, you know, no I'm risk. Just, no that's, risk. That's like that's so new. I'm still I, in that regard. I'm still a little old fashioned. Like <laughs> I met my wife at Bible Bible school. Like, but I, don't, I walked I, up and I told can't. my wife, said, "I never met you before." <laughs> <laughs> You've never met me. <laughs> welcome. Uh, no, You're honestly, welcome. I yes. met my wife at a camp. Uh, we got married. I moved to her hometown. Okay. We were there for five years. And where? And that is where? Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville. Actually, she was. She's actually from from St. Augustine, which is the oldest city in America. Oh wow. Um. So she's from there, and we got married in Jacksonville in 2015, and we were there, and God opened the doors for Tampa. And honestly, I uh, never thought I would move here, but it's been the best decision of my yeah. life. I love this church. I love my pastors. It's been amazing. So we're here. It's really cool to, I, I stand in the middle between these people that I'm sure they may have met before we've met, but I, I, I love uh, situations like this. I see this a lot in my life. I, I, I meet somebody that is very, you know, very special to me or has spoken in my life like this man. And I meet somebody like this who is a great friend who I can't imagine my life without. And man, when they come together, it's like, wow. You know, yeah. I, I see, like I've seen that so many different relationships the, the in back my life. The backstory is so great, Draylon, of, of how God orchestrates people's lives. Yeah. I was trying to get uh, EJ here and I was having trouble getting him over here. Yeah. It just wasn't working. There was some obstacles in the way. Yeah. And, but he didn't know I was trying to get him here. And then he gets a job offer here in Tampa and shows up on a Sunday, the very same Sunday I had invited him to be here, but I, we couldn't work the details out with his pastor. Yet he then had the job offer and he came to Tampa and visits on a Sunday morning. Wow. So me being me, I just did a job interview on the spot. I walked back <laughs> in the middle of worship and I said, we got EJ Latouche here. He's a worship pastor. And I just handed him the mic. Wow. He did. This is why you gotta That's be see. Great. I do this. <laughs> I do this. So he caught me, and I was like, "Well, I gotta be ready." <laughs> yeah. You yeah. ain't new to this. You true to true this. To this. <laughs> right. So he got that up and sang, funny. and I'm watching him going, "Okay, this might work. This might work." Because our previous worship pastor was transitioning away, and we were looking, and he was out of town that weekend. So it just like played right into this moment, and then from there, God opened some doors, and it's been amazing. So instant in season, <laughs> out yes, 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 ready. Yes, I used to, when I was young, I used to go to services, whether it was general conference or because of times, and I'd have a sermon in my Bible. In case, and I'd be like, Lord, I think my sermon fits right now where they are. I'm 22 years old and going, yep, if Brother Mangan asked me, I'm ready. I love I'm that. ready. I'm I ready right that, now. I and I did that. that for years. And then one time when I was 24, it actually happened. Wow. At a conference. I, I, it, was, it was not the conference. It was the Sunday before. And I was down there at this church just sitting in the teaching, listening to the pastor teach. And he said, uh, Robert Tisdale's in here. Come up here and testify. And I walked up and I was always trained and I'll just help everybody listening. Yes. When you're asked to testify, testify. When you're asked to preach, preach. Don't yes. mix the two. So, um, <laughs> especially if you want to come to the life. And so, come, so, especially if you want to come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, or even get an invite. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so what happened Jeez. is I just went up and did a little you know, minute testimonial. And I walk off and he said, the Lord just spoke to me. You're supposed to preach. Can you do it right now at 11 o'clock? And it's like between transition services. And I said, let me go get my Bible because I had a sermon in there. I was ready. I'd already asked God, if you had something for me, what do I say? Okay. And then so, that, uh, listen, wait, but listen, then that I preach. Okay. Spirit moves. We had a good day. I'm young. I'm 24, I think. And then they call me the next. He says, OK, I feel like Lord told me you're supposed to be here next week at this big conference and you're going to preach with Lee Stone King. And that was like a. You were 24. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. That's crazy. Okay, so jumping straight back into the conversation that we're having and how to tie these back together, you were just talking about, you know, the, your destiny and, and, and how this was your destination, but all the other things before were the details, you know, and, and can, you, can you speak to that, especially from your experience of what are we supposed to be doing? I hear this question a lot, you know, from, you know, people in our generation and younger, you know, how do we get ready or how do we know what we're supposed to be doing or, you know, what our destination is? Because a lot of people, when it comes to those things, 
as we get older, like we just want to get hooked in on the thing that that God wants us to do. But a lot of times, you know, it, it's it's hard to, you know, for, for people to grasp the concept of, man, just be available, just be ready. You know, so, like so, what, so let's go to scripture. Let's talk Elijah and Elisha. So Elijah walks by. And this is, you know, he's under directive. Your next three things, he's come out of the cave after his highest moment of success ministerially. Right. You know, the, the false prophets of Baal and Asher have been defeated. Right. He's now hiding and he's then run farther into the wilderness. He's in a cave and God speaks so softly to him. And I love that because that's always such a beautiful imagery to me is that he's not in all these demonstrative right experiences he's in that small still voice and you know you whisper and you have to be close to be heard and I think it's kind of like showing us that he's close to us enough that he can speak softly so you have to have a relationship that's intimate enough to hear his voice in a quiet way and so the first thing you do is you got to have an intimate relationship. But moving on, so he says, go anoint your successor. So he knows, so God's already picked Elisha. Elijah now has to be obedient to that choosing of God. So he, this isn't random. He walks by and he smites him with his cloak. But it's really imperative you look at what he's doing. The Bible says he's, he's plowing behind 11 other men and 11 over the yoke of oxen. That means two men per yoke, most likely. So then he says, oh, I'm going to follow you. He goes, leave me alone. You're not following me. You know, you go back to your mama, basically. You go back to what you're doing. But he takes those oxen and the instruments that he's working with. He burns them, makes a fire, slaughters the oxen. So you know what that tells us? He's an entrepreneur. Wow. He's successful because to own all of those right pieces of farming equipment yeah. and to own the oxen and have the ability, you don't slaughter your employer stuff. Right, right. So he's successful. Yeah. So the key to long-term anointing and a mantle falling on your life and purpose, finding your destiny is faithful in what you do. Yes. Do the small stuff with excellence. Yes. Consistency in your spiritual disciplines. And I, I teach our, our staff here, there are really two tests for every individual who's walking into the purpose of God. There's the test of obscurity yes. and there's the, there's the test of notoriety. Wow. And you got to pass them both. Wow. And so Elisha is not lazy. He's productive. Yeah. And, and you know, we could dive into a really deep uh, concept and talk about, you know, what is plowing? It's breaking up unproductive areas. And we could go really a long way with this because I love this story. So he's breaking up unproductive areas and planting. So he's growing things. He's, he's doing something. He's successful. But then he's so sensitive to there's something else for you. He's not attached. And that's the key. Because we want a mantle, but we want attachment to our past. We're not willing to burn things and let them go and move to the next level. And so when you really, so, so and first, the first is the calling. The second is that mantle that comes later. But you know what he leaves? He leaves success and entrepreneurism and all of this kind of business. Yes. And he goes and pours water on the hands of the man of God. He serves yes. because we see men as an avenue to a mantle but it's really about serving another man wow. to get a mantle. And you have to be careful that you just don't serve people to get what they have. Right. And I have people come up to me after a church and go, you know, at a conference or camp, say, lay hands on me that I can have your mantle. And mantles aren't that, they don't transfer that way. They're not cheap. We have mantle falling, you know, there's mantles falling, grab one. Mantles aren't free. Mantles are sacrificial. Mantles come to people that are submitted <laughs> and mantles come to people who are willing to serve. Will you, that is so... Oh my goodness. So, so that's so, how so you get good. to the place that becomes your destiny in my mind. Because then what is it? So and I know you were about to ask a question, but when uh, Elisha asked Elijah, he says, or Elijah says, tell me what you want. He says, I, I want a double portion of what you have. And he says, well, that cost, it's going to, you have to be present in the moment or you don't get it. So you can't, you have to be connected to me and I can't tell you when it's going to happen. So, so during this multiple years of service, there's matriculation going on. He's learning and that matriculation means dripping into. But then finally there truly is a transference, but it only came through submission, sacrifice, obedience. It only came through service. And then it's handed into his life because he catches it and instantly something starts happening in Elisha. But 
he had been successful first. So, you know, you can't have never done something and expect God to... God doesn't call people to great things who haven't done little things. Wow. Does that make sense? Yes. God and and God is conspiring greatness for all of us, but he's waiting on us to be faithful in the small things. Yeah. So when, when no one knows your name and you're, you're, you're moving through obscurity... Yeah when you're not getting invited to speak, when there's no songs on other people's albums, when you're not writing the, the, the songs, when you're not ministering in the word, when you're not getting opportunities, can you be faithful? In the things that will make you great, can you be faithful? So, you know, I, I would love to dive into it. I know we don't have time, but think about, think about looking at the back end of Oxen all day. That's really not all that exciting. <laughs> but you know what you're not doing? At not, not at even, all. Not, not even at all. a little bit. But, but think about this, though. But he's <laughs> learning to be faithful. Yeah. Then when he serves the man of God, that don't sound real exciting either. Yeah. So he's, but he's been faithful and consistent through kind of a time when he's in obscurity. He, you know, can you imagine being in the room and this is Elijah and you're just the servant? You're washing his hands, you're taking care of him, you're carrying his stuff, you're just serving. And if you can't serve with excellence, you will never walk in excellence and anointing. It just doesn't happen. And so he serves him, he catches the anointing, and then, you know, kind of the rest is history. But that obscure time, you have to pass the test of obscurity. Because if you don't, you'll move ministries, you'll move cities, you'll change churches, You'll change jobs because you can't get comfortable in obscurity. Wow. And then, of course, we could talk a long time about notoriety. Right. you got to pass both. And right. truthfully, I feel like you kind of rotate back through them. You know, and there's a statement I love to make. God is more interested in developing your character than solving your problems. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So he will keep you in those tests until you pass. Ooh. It's not like our education system. We just throw them out. Whether they can read or not, you got to pass it with God. I heard something very similar. Uh, it's a guy, his name is Caleb Herring. Uh -huh. And uh, he's a, I think he's a, I think he's an evangelist at this point. Uh, I don't know if he's pastoring or anything like that, but uh, I heard him make that same statement that God, to, the, to that same degree, it's like, you know, God is more committed, he's committed to your character than your calling, you For, know, so than, 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 than your title or whatever it is that you're, that you're wanting you know to do. Why? You know why? So let's, let's talk about why. Mm -hmm. Why would God be more committed to character than calling? Because we all know people, okay, mm -hmm. that their calling took them somewhere, their character couldn't sustain right, them. Right, right. So God is not interested in more trophies in hell. Wow. Oh. Ooh. That's, a, that's an old sermon you should look up by T.G. McNeely called oh. Trophies of Hell. But he talks about hell being lined with people who had destiny and callings on them, but they're just hanging on the walls now Jesus. as mementos of Satan's past conquest. I don't think he says it like that, but that's the idea. And so the reality is this, is so many awesome people, they're anointed, they're they're. Awesome, yes. but their character is not. And, and we do this. We elevate people too fast. Yes, we do. And when we push you to a place that your character can't sustain you, we're somewhat responsible. But oftentimes, the brighter the lights, the more the flaw is revealed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when we're on that stage and those lights are on tonight, the more flawed we are, the, the easier it is to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't fix that in private, it will be revealed in public. Man, that is so, that's just great, great, great stuff. You talked a lot about, you know, submission and, um, you know, serving. You know, they, they wanted to know, you know, his disciples wanted to know who was going to be the greatest, right? They wanted to know who was, who was going to be known. And, and they thought in that moment that it was a physical kingdom. They thought that it was, that was what they were used to seeing, that they were used to seeing, you know, people reigning and, and, you know, and they thought that he was going to be this king that was going to, but they, they were, they were taken back to the point where he, he, he was up on a cross, you know, and he really reigned in majesty at that point and they didn't want anything to do with that, you know, so it seems like when you start talking about character, you start talking about submission and giving and serving and, and giving of yourself, it's really, really nice to talk about, but it's another thing to actually live that out and actually be. We all want a resurrection. Who wants to die? <laughs> That's it. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Who wants the death in their family? I mean, there's so much going on there, and serving is 
a fundamental part because, you know, if, if Jesus Christ, let's say let's, let's Jesus, if God was concerned about titles, why did Jesus get born in a barn? Right, exactly. He's not. He's not concerned about titles. Right. We are. Right. If he was concerned about titles, he wouldn't have been born in obscurity. Right. He would have been a prince. Mm -hmm. He would have been placed in a palace. Mm -hmm. But God has never been interested in the labels people define even himself with. Wow. I love, in fact, it's one of my, I just dig on some of these things when he says, I've, I searched, I've looked, I've searched all of the heavens, I've searched the stars, there's none like me. Yeah. Just letting you know. <laughs> I defy description. Pastor you know, Hoffman. You, you can't label me. Pastor Hoffman says, you know, there's a problem. There's, there's an issue. With, there's one issue with God is that he actually thinks he's God. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. God thinks he's God. He really, he really thinks he is. He knows he is. You know? yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. Um, okay, so I got a couple of questions here that I think would be really cool to, you know, even ask both of you. Um, and you guys can just, you know, kind of jump into it the way you feel. Um, you know, and, and I know this from being a worship pastor. Uh, obviously, I, I am a support role to the pastor. Um, on a pastoral staff, and I know what it's like to get the in runs. You know, Pastor, Ho Pastor Hoffman calls them the in run, where it's basically like, hey, you're not Pastor Tisdale, so I, I don't have to listen to you. And it's like, no, Pastor Tisdale put him in, put us in the place to be able to tell you this because we actually know that he's not going to talk to you, you know, like he's worried about things that he needs to be worried about, which is why I'm here, you know. Um, but just talking about that space, whenever I ask that question, I want you to be able to feel, feel comfortable answering this question is what is your favorite thing about pastoring? You know, and I'll start with you this time and then we can go to to pastor. So I think in my role, it's one of those things is where I get to lead in worship in one of the most important aspects of a service. Right. And there's this notion, I think it's an age old as time is worship or preaching, but they're one and the same. I think for me is preaching or worship is preaching in music form. Yeah. I think the way that we write stuff, the way that it's like formulated, but I look at it, this is the word is for us, the worship is for him. Yes. And yes. We take in, we see worship, right? We think music. We know the origins of worship right. is not rooted sacrifice, in music, yeah. it's sacrifice. And honestly, leading not only in music, and, but in sacrifice. Yes. And I like that I get to wow. worship with other people that love God. And I'm in a house, I have a, a pastor that loves worship. Yes. There's pastors that don't love the, the Come music on now. portion of worship. Come on now. It's just, it's an added... Oh. If we get, that's fine. Pastor, sometimes he'll he'll tell me to keep going, and I'm out. I'm out. Of, I'm out of, I'm, I'm I'm out. Out of songs. I'm out, Doc. I'm dry. <laughs> I'm out. And sometimes he'll come up. He'll start singing, doing yes. his thing. I think that uh, there has never been um, a man of God in my life that I that I mesh with. Yeah. We have like these untold like signals. Yes. It's almost like my like like yes. we know. He, so I think it's crazy. For me, it's that I get to lead a great team of worshipers. Yes. And I'm not just in I'm not just in innocent bystanders, but I'm in the trenches. I'm in the mosh pit. Up front, we call it the mosh pit. Yeah. They yeah. come up and they're just worshiping and they're going crazy. I get to be a part of that. Yes. And it's amazing. That's I love that you said that, that you're a part of that, that you're in the midst of it, because there's this, there's this picture that I've seen on social media where it's like talking about the difference between a boss and a leader, where the boss is pointing to yes. the people saying, hey, go over here, do this. And the leaders up front with the people pulling the pulling the work with them. And I see that that I would agree with you just from our same roles. It's like, man, I love being in the trenches with the team so that pastor can just worry about the things that only he can worry about. That, that, you know, you know we're I, worshipers I first, that. leaders second, all of us. Yes, and, you know, years ago at the Little Bitty Church, I was so frustrated watching people come in late that it really stole my joy. Wow. So I took all the chairs off before it was cool, and I sat on the front row before it was a thing. I yeah. mean, we're talking 30-plus <laughs> years ago yes. because I needed, I wanted to protect my worship wow. because I'm a worshiper yes. first. Yes. I was here three weeks as pastor and took the chairs off the platform. Wow. Because I said, look, 
up there, you're watching me. Down here, we're worshiping together. Yes. And so I'm not, not throwing stones at anybody that, you know, you have chairs up there. That's great. Have your chairs. But for me and yeah. my house yeah. and this house, yeah. we're worshipers first before we're servers. Yes. And if you can't worship, then I don't want you to serve wow. in our church. Wow. You got to worship first. And that, you know, we, we, we schedule breaks into our, pe into our people who volunteer because we want them to get back to that heart of worship. But my favorite thing is really simple. Making people the best version of themselves. Yes. Yeah. That's it. And watching people grow. Watching people transform. That's my favorite thing. And that encompasses everything I do from the preaching to the talking to the counseling to the loving to the serving to the giving to the generosity. Making people the best version of themselves. That's a moniker we have here and we talk about it all. I feel it's my mandate. That's my goal, to make people. And if I make people better, I make Tampa better. Wow, oh, that's so good. That's so good. I love that. Um, I, I think I've heard that from other, other leaders as well, that that's their favorite thing. It's just watching lives change and being a part of that and walking with them. What would you say is the least thing that you like, like about being a pastor? Meetings. 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 <laughs> Meetings. <laughs> I feel like Pastor, him and Pastor Hoffman are like the same. <laughs> Pastor Hoffman is the same way. He's like, I don't like meetings at all. But Pastor Mike does like meetings. Yeah, but, that's yeah. good news. That's good news. Way to go, Pastor Mike. We all have gifts. Way to go. We all have gifts. Shout out to Pastor yeah. Mike. You're awesome, bro. But me and Hoff, yes. no meetings. So. We have the meetings for him, basically. Uh, just a couple more questions I want to jump into before we jump into rapid fire, and then we can end this ep episode. Um, but... What are some of the biggest challenges you've faced in your life, like as a leader, as a pastor? This could be as a husband, a father, whatever slashes that are in front of your name. My first pastor, it was tough because I was in a place I didn't understand and a location I didn't like, but it was about the making of me. So God was, had me on a potter's wheel and I was broken. He broke me to remake me and it was tough. And that was the hardest. And that's where, you know, now I would not be who I am or where I am without that process. But that process was unkind and difficult. Wow. And so a lot of mental anguish, a lot of frustrations, a lot of trying to do the right thing and never seeing any return on the right thing. So a, a tough time. And so, you know, in, in, and this is not a general thing. This is very specific, but it would take too much time to explain what it was like. But my first pastor at nine and a half years, the first five were brutal. Brutal. And so, you know, you, you can serve in ministry, and this is so uh, perfect for this moment. In Mark 8, I spoke recently in our church uh, in verse 22, and it talks about a man who is touched by Christ, and then he is halfway healed. He can see, but not clearly. And then he puts spit in his eyes, and he can see clearly. But the very first thing the Lord did was led him out of the place he was. So he actually, it's a third, there's three interactions where he touches him. And the first one is he brings him out. And I had to be brought out of bad conditioning, bad thinking, uh, bad paradigms. And the coming out process when God is developing you is very painful if you're stubborn like me. <laughs> you know, some people are good at it, but, but I, wasn't, I wasn't a good patient. And so it took the Lord a little while to get me what he wanted me to be. You know, and you gotta get yourself out of the way. You know, you're out of Egypt, but is Egypt out of you? Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> that was subtle. <laughs> it was subtle. It was very subtle. That was subtle. What about you? I know you spoke a little bit about yeah. speech impediment, that sort of deal. Like, but is, would that be it or would it be something else? Or It's something else. And mine is probably a conundrum because my least favorite thing is also my favorite thing, people. <laughs> and let me expound on that is... Not just, it's, I have a lot of friends that are no longer in church, but they had potential. And I think it's one of those things is people and the lost potential mm -hmm. frustrates me, yeah. even because I went through that in my own life where, you know, it's the, un, you, you don't know what lies ahead. What yeah. is the future hold? What, am, what is EJ supposed to do? Right. And you live in this revolving door of what, what, am, I, what am I called to do? And I learned that my biggest issue was I was trying to figure out what am I called to do, but I was doing it already. Yeah. I just wasn't, I wasn't engraved in it. My mindset was different. Yeah. And I think what it is, is for me, is people are the most frustrating because 
And I don't mean that in an ugly way. I mean that is people are people. Yeah. I work for a, 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 well, I used to work for a large company and they said their main thing was, it said people are going to be people yeah. and you can expect them to be people. Yeah. In the church, it's the same way. In ministry, it's the same way is that you see people that have a gift or you see people that, you know, uh, you know they're called to do amazing things and they don't see it. Um, and it's one of those things where for me, it's a little bit frustrating. And then I have friends along the way that are no longer in it because they couldn't pass the test of time. Yeah. So, it's yeah, you know, I think we, I, we all have that. And, you know, me not necessarily growing up in church my entire life. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I've been in, I've been going to church since I was probably, I would say about 12 years old. Um, and I'm 30 now, I'll be 31 this year. And over the past 18 years, like just seeing, like, I, you know how, when you grow up in church, I feel like people have that, that experience a lot more. It's a lot more often like, you, you grow up with people, you go to church or you see things and then, you know, you just kind of, you, you, you kind of see that, you kind of, but it's different when it's somebody that's, that you're, that you're really close, close to, to that you're watching them not do the thing that, man, I just know this. Like, I know that you were destined and purposed to do this. Like, God has clearly gifted you to be able to do this for his kingdom. And I will say that is definitely, you know, one of one of the hardest things. Surviving for me as disappointment well. is one of the, the skills you have to learn in ministry because people will disappoint. Plans will fail and people will fail. And you have to learn and you have to make a decision. You have to pre-decide that I won't quit regardless of what I encounter. You have to you have to determine that early on. And then because people are going to flake off, people are going to walk away, people are going to betray. And, and if you are focused on people as your affirmation, if your affirmation is found in numbers, yeah. in, in likes, right. in, in how many followers you have, if that's what your affirmation comes from, there will be at some point devastation yeah. Yeah. because not everyone's going to like you. Yeah. And you have to, you know, I, I like to say it, and, and it's a little bit of a joke, but it's very serious. I never became more free when I stopped worrying about the people in the cheap seats. And unless you're as committed to God as I am, I'm just not going to listen to what you say. I'm just going to keep pressing on. Let me jump into that a little more. And this leads us to our last question. And you can just give whatever it is that you feel on that. You know, especially, you know, this is an issue. This is an issue amongst other people. But this is also something that I feel like we as ministers or, you know, whoever, if you're a minister, you, you need to care what the right people think. Yes. Right. Yes. So there's a space of. There, it, Court Chavis told me this, you know, I, I was dealing with, you know, not having my father, not, you know, going through a ton of things in my personal life, you know, not having that sense of um, validation or knowing what that's supposed to look like. And I remember him telling me, he's like, Draylon, validation is very important, but it's just a matter, it's just a matter of you, you, you need to, you don't need to care what everybody thinks, but you need to care about what the right people think. And for me, that's something that I have to continually put on the altar. I have to put, this is a personal thing for me is because I value people so much. I value relationships so much because relationships, we were just talking about this the other night, relationships have genuinely changed my life. And I value relationships with people more than money, more than time, more than, like, man, I, you know, I always say this, to people that I, you know, that I'm leading or counseling, I talk about four main resources in your life. And, you know, it's probably not original with me, but the way I order those, the fourth most important is money out of the four. You only have so much money to, to, to do what you need to do or, or go where you need to go or whatever. The third one is your energy. You only have so much energy to give to a specific project or a specific time. And then the second one would be your time. You're, you only have so much time in a day. You only have so much time in a life in a lifespan, and and but the number one for me is your relationships with people. To me, that's the only that is the only real resource out of the all four that can give you all three of the other ones. Because time can't buy you money, 
or time can't give you money, money can't buy you time, money can't buy energy, you can't buy energy, energy won't give you, you know, more, it's none of that stuff. It can't, it can't really coincide, but man, you know some good people, some people that can help you save time. You know some people that can give you energy when you're just around them. Like I gain energy when I'm around people like you. And I know people that give money, that give that so money into, into the vision that I'm doing or the vision that you're doing or the vision that you're doing. It's like, man, so for me, relationships are so important to me. But sometimes I have to put those things on the altar and give that to God because a lot of times I wrap myself up in caring what this person that I had a great relationship with during this season is so important to me, but maybe that, that season has shifted or changed. I'd love for you to speak to that and say, you know, what, what are some things, that's something that I have to put on the altar constantly. You can speak to that or say anything that you have to constantly put on the altar or you as well. What, what would you speak to that? Well, you know, affirmation has to be derived from God. And your first primary relationship is God. Right. So my circle is small. Okay. And what I mean by that, I have a large circle of acquaintances. Right. But the circle of influencers into my spirit is very small. Right. And the reason for that is I want people in my life that contribute to my advancement, yeah. my maturity. I also want people in my life that have the honesty to have veto power, yeah. to speak to me about my decisions and my directions and my concepts so you can't give that to everyone nor you have to guard your spirit because if you you know first peter 1 and 9 said receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your soul meaning the salvation of your soul comes somewhere toward the end right so you, you, we got to make it paul said i fought a good fight i kept the faith i finished the course so finding the course and finishing it is imperative and having the right people on the journey is what makes it enjoyable. Yeah. It's also what makes you a better individual. And so rather than following the crowd, you have to put the people in your life that are gonna speak into it with honesty and integrity and authenticity. So you build relationships around you that are valuable. That doesn't mean, and when I say that, that I don't care what others think, we all do. Right. We wanna be, it's, it's, it's human nature to want to be accepted and liked. Right. But you have to come to a point, like I literally just read this thing, it was so interesting to me. It was, it was about a guy trying to solve problems. And he said, I never go on Reddit or on the internet and say, how do you do this? He said, no one will help me. I go on and I ask a question and then I log in under an anonymous account and I give a terrible way of solving the problem that is definitely wrong. And I will get hundreds of responses of people correcting the bad one with the right solution because people are more interested in correcting you than helping you. Oh my goodness. So he has studied it. Wow. He's literally, when he hits something he doesn't know how to do, he asks the question, makes up a silly answer, and he has hundreds of answers oh. of what to do right. But he said, if I don't go in there and give a wrong answer, no one will answer it. It'll, left, it'll be left unanswered on Reddit or wherever he's done it. And I thought, wow, what does that tell us about human nature? Right. That people are more interested in criticizing or correcting Failure. than they are in helping and contributing. You know, so we have something I say a lot around here. You know, the scripture tells us in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to mourn, right? And a time to yeah. dance, a time to cry, a time to laugh, a time to sing, blah, blah, blah. So I say this, we're really great at mourning with people and grieving, but we're terrible at celebrating. Right. You need some people in your life that will celebrate with you. Yes. Not, not just correct you that will live life with you authentically when it's up and when it's down. So when you put those right people around you and you're saying, you know, you lay some things on the altar worrying about what other think, but that's the people that you bring into the network of counsel and they contribute. And you say, should I be worried about this moment? How am I viewing this attitude or rejection or conversation? Help me walk this path. The scripture said there are safety in the multitude of counsel. So you get a counseling circle around you of peers and mentors that you can say, how do I do this and how should I feel? Because your emotions will lie to you. The scripture says that your heart's deceitfully right. yes. wicked. Yes. So, and you don't even know how to tame it. You don't even know how to pray properly right. according to Romans right. 8, 26. Right. So if you don't have that balance around you, you will then be led by your emotions and your emotions will always lead you down a path of right. difficulty. Right, that's so powerful.
so, so powerful. We got time for, first of all, I want to say before we jump into the final uh, rapid question section, thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, man, this is going to, I just feel really, really, um, really blessed to be here and excited for what God's going to do tonight. Um, I, you know, we were just at PDQ. We ate there and there was a, there was a couple there that were from, they were wearing Michigan gear. And so I'm like, you know, hey, you guys from Michigan or whatever? They're like, no, we're actually from Georgia. Um, you know, we're here. Our daughter plays softball for Michigan U and they're here playing uh, USF, I think it is. And uh, so, you know, we start talking about, talking about Alter Nice to them. They sound super excited. So hopefully they come. Um, but just, just to be able to be in a city and be able to direct people to a church. If you're in the Tampa, Florida area, you need to come check out Tampa Life. It's an incredible place, dynamic worship, dynamic preaching, but most of all, it's, it, it, it's all about family here. It's all about uh, just, just, just creating a space for you uh, to grow as an individual and to grow your family in a safe place. And so uh, I've been here, I've led worship a couple, a couple times here, and uh, I've just been blessed being here. Oh, <laughs> this is one of my favorite churches for sure. Um, <laughs> we have other places for alternate. Yes, we do, for sure. Okay, so we're going to end this uh, episode with rapid fire questions. I'm going to do uh, five and five. I'll start with uh, Pastor EJ and then I'll go uh, finish with uh, Pastor Robert. So, favorite song right now? <sighs> That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I probably should have asked him. You ask the hard thing, sir. <laughs> um, you know what? I would say Jesus, Draylon Young. Stop. Uh, woo! Bro, that's a good on, one, bro. bro. Come on, that's man. All right, we're going to keep going. We're gonna that's a good one. <laughs> that's, that's you know me. So yeah. do I go next? <laughs> do I go next or does he go next? You can, you, can, you can go next. So I can't ever remember song titles. Ask, ask EJ. I just make up lyrics and all that <laughs> stuff. You know, I butchered your stuff and everybody's stuff. I, I just, oh, that's you know. completely fine. So, but what? it's that one, you know. It uh, is, it's, the, it's the elevation and it is. It is uh, uh, more than able. He's not done with me yet. You know oh, that okay, one, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's my favorite part. Okay. When they do that, I'm just broken every time. More than able. Yes. That's yes. the wrecking, more man. Than we might need to hit that tonight. So just just be ready for that. That's like my favorite. Because you know he going he know he preaching tonight. He gonna come up yeah. and say he gonna say come on. That's Pastor Hoffman. He do the same thing. Adrenaline, come up here, sing my song. <laughs> and I know exactly what song he's talking about at that point. And at that point, it was Chainbreaker by by Zach Williams. No way. <laughs> that was his jam. At any given time, he'd be like, Adrenaline, come up here, sing my song. Yes, sir. <laughs> Talk about serving. <laughs> Favorite city. Tampa. Okay. Tampa. Right. We'll okay. Go yeah, Tampa. We'll in the get, U.S. for yes. sure. Tampa. Favorite travel destination. An Man. unmentioned, unnamed island. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Okay. I love the I love the ocean and love the water and islands. Okay. Yeah. I don't want everybody to know where I go. <laughs> like, so actually, I'm I, gatekeeping. I like. So we actually visited this place in Concord. Concord, in North Carolina. North Carolina. Well, that's okay. like we've been in California for a minute. I was in. No, oh, no, what? No, no. <laughs> it was like this little like farm treehouse vibe. We really liked that. Okay. I really like. Okay. That. Favorite scripture. Ooh. If you had to pick one. Oh, that's tough. Oh, Jesus man. wept. Let me Jesus <laughs> wept. <laughs> I'm playing. That's not my favorite question. Why? Because <laughs> uh, he's human. Uh, so uh, connected to our emotions. Yeah, you can answer that. But, it's but you know, I don't, I, man, that's hard. That I say it all one. the time preaching. This is my favorite one. And then I hear myself mm -hmm. say it like three weeks later. This is my favorite scripture. And it's always something different. <laughs> so uh, I, I love Psalms. I love the Proverbs. I love Psalms 27. Lord is okay. my light. It's one of my favorite passages, yeah. okay. but but honestly, that, that's almost impossible for me to answer. It's true. You know? It's a hard question. That's difficult. I would say probably, no, I can't answer that. You can't answer that? Oh, I, I, you know, there's one I love out of Isaiah that I really think uh, it symbolizes everything that this church does. And thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restore of paths to dwell in, and they that be of thee shall build up the old waste places. Wow. Where is that? In Isaiah, Isaiah, I want to say 55-ish, somewhere okay. in there. But, okay. but I love it because it's kind of who we we'll are as a church. We'll find it and put it, put it yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Favorite quote? Ooh. Favorite quote. Favorite quote. Does this have to be know, from a lot of them? Like, it did, any quote, just quote. Okay, so I have a quote, and this is what I tell our team here. I say, let them hear us, 
let them see us, but let them give you all the glory. Okay. I love okay? that. Really? That's your, that, but that's your, your quote. Yeah. So y'all, we going to, y'all keep that and say that to y'all's worship. Too. Brilliant minds have always suffered violent opposition from mediocre spirits. Wow. Albert Einstein. That's Ooh. fire. We're going to leave that right, way. Let me change my. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of butchered that. that. I kind of made that one up just like I do song lyrics. It's hey, really that. close to that. It's, it's, it's br- somewhere it's around brilliant that. spirits, <laughs> suffered violent from mediocre, something mediocre oh, minds or whatever, you know. It's, Go it's, to it's, books. Yeah. Go to book. Go to book. Like if you recommend one book for oh, whoever's watching, man. one book. One book. Court Chavis is, is always uh, how to win friends and influence people. Yeah, go to book. Yep. At the, my go to books are the books I'm reading right now, usually. It's what I'm in. Yeah. Okay. There's one I'm reading on called uh, Loyalty and Disloyalty. It's okay. great. It's written by a, uh, South, uh, or a pastor from Ghana. Okay. It's amazing. Uh, okay. But it's called Loyalty and Disloyalty. I couldn't tell you his name off the top of my head, but right now, that's my go to. Okay. Hmm. Probably Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. James oh, yeah, Clear, right? Yeah, I like right? that one. Yeah, that's pretty yes. good. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great that's a good one. one. Okay, yeah. fly or road trip? Road trip. Road trip? Fly. Okay. I lived here six years and only driven out of Florida once since I've been here twice. <laughs> <laughs> since I stopped traveling, I, don't, like, I, I can only get on an airplane. I don't drive no more. Except, uh-uh. I drive from here to the well, church house. to the my church house. The church and the house. <laughs> And, and, and the restaurant. It's the restaurant. Right there. That's, That's it. it. Right there. That's yeah. it. Okay. Basketball or football? Basketball. Football all day. Okay. All day long. <laughs> all day long. Fred Hammond or Israel Houghton? Ooh. That's good. No. Ooh. Next question. <laughs> what you mean? You got to answer it. You can't do that. Fred Hammond or Israel Houghton? Fred. Fred. Fred? Fred. Yeah. Are you kidding me? No. Man, oh his, my his goodness. tone, Fred. His tone. Oh, wow. But that's a hard question. And though. he's like, and he was like kind of a a, a trailblazer for in gospel. It's very true. That's it's, kind of what yeah, I he's like. He's the Godfather, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Hillsong or Bethel? Hillsong. Throw elevation in there. I don't like either one of them. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hillsong. I go there. Elevation. <laughs> Throw an elevation. I don't like either one of them. <laughs> That's that great. Crazy. That's great. They sing too many Jesus is my girlfriend. That was <laughs> yeah, so I just get, I get like, can we stop? Can we stop? Ah, yeah. yes. uh, the man of God has spoken. Okay, last question. Favorite sermon of all time? Oh, I don't think I've ever been asked that. You thinking? Yeah. Or just do one. Because I know that's like next to impossible to just choose one. Uh, favorite sermon. That's tough, man. That's tough. I'm thinking through, thinking I don't say, I want to say that's my favorite. I'm thinking that's through tough. different ones in my life. Mm. A really impacting one when I was young was one by Jeff Arnold called The Miracle is Looking for the Vessel. Yes. So good. And it just spoke to me as a kid. But mm-hmm. there's so many more. Oh, there there's yep. so many more. <sighs> okay. There's two. It's a tie. Okay. So our pastor, he did a series here when I first arrived here uh, called uh, Limitless. Oh, wow. Oh, you weren't supposed to say me, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the I second mean, one. I mean, the, if, if somebody is sitting The second one was a message you. that I watched a lot, and it's by Jeff Arnold's Life's Three um, greatest words. Mm-hmm. Are you persuaded? That's another that's one. A, that's, wow. that's cool. That's cool. That's, that's cool. great. Okay, I got a question to close. Okay. Okay? Yes, Just, I want to know who's got the best shoe game today. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I, I, got, think, I, I think I'm... I got the beaters on. I think on. I'm <laughs> beating EJ for the first time ever. That's right I think now. he is. I, think I got my might be. He is. I think I might be beating uh, Jalen, He's beating me. Come on. He might Come be. On. I'm winning. Especially, I'm winning especially today. In, especially in cost. <laughs> Let's don't go there. Let's don't go and there. And cost he probably up there for us. <laughs> yes, bro. Yes, yeah. I got the beaters on, so don't don't don't, don't do this. I'm, I'm finally beating EJ. I won the shoe game. It's on it camera. Yeah. It's on yeah. camera. Well, hey, this has been uh, conversations at the altar with Draylon Young, Pastor Robert Tisdale, and Worship Pastor EJ Latouche. I'm honored to be here. Altar nights is tonight. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Please hit that subscribe button if you have not subscribed. Uh, Like, comment, and share this with somebody. Share this with a friend. Share this with somebody that uh, needs to hear this. And go back. I encourage you, go back 
to all the stuff that we talked about, please take notes. Write this stuff down. Get it in your soul. And we'll see you on the next episode. God bless. See you on the flip side. <laughs>